afternoon, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for a very special conversation. I will be your host for this program. I am the spokesperson for the US mission to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a sensitive topic, also a complex topic, but also sometimes a very simple topic. And that is, how do we treat one another? How do we coexist with one another? How do we just get along and appreciate each other's differences? So we are gonna be delving into all kinds of topics within the framework of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, intersex, queer, plus communities. And of course, there are more letters in that alphabet, and maybe we'll talk about those today. We're gonna to, maybe we'll talk about all kinds of topics today. I hope we approach a wide range of subtopics. And I invite you, our members of the audience, who have questions, comments, ideas, please share with that, share those questions with us in the chat box, and we'll address them. So. Without further ado, let's bring in our two wonderful guests for the day. So let's start with Sarah. I'm gonna say your name correctly, I hope. Donna Pong, Sarah Wanakot. Welcome to the program. Good, evening. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Excellent. Sarah Donna Wanakot. Yeah, and Great. I'm from Not the Let to Be Equal. Great, thanks so much. Sarah is from Thailand, and we're so happy that she is joining us today. And then let's switch over to our other introduction of our other guest. And I'm going to say your name correctly. You'll let me know if I don't. Hamikar Chanhuiko Jr. Welcome to the program. Hi, Jason. Hello, everyone, to all of our listeners for our audience. I am Ham, and my pronouns are he, him, and she. Maraming salamat. Great, thank you so much. And let's pause just for a moment there. You introduced me to a new pronoun, a new term before we started the program. So please let us know, what, what is that pronoun? And of course that comes from the Philippines where you're from, but please explain it for our audience. Well, in the Filipino language, Jason, um, Sha indicates both she and he. Thus, it, is, uh, it has no gender indication. So it's a gender neutral pronoun. It's a common term that we use in the Philippine LGBTIQ movement. Mm -hmm. And that's a term specifically used by the LGBTIQ community or is it used by uh, other communities as well? It is generally used because since it's a common language, but we've been pushing to um, promote it since it is something that is um, truly Filipino. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a term that people are already familiar with and thus could more easily adopt than in some languages that don't have that kind of a neutral pronoun where there's a lot of linguistic debates about how we refer to people, how we, how we can be inclusive and respectful. But some languages, you already have a term. So it, yeah. makes, it, it makes it easier. Okay, well, for our audience, both of our guests are going to have an opportunity to make a presentation. We talked about it a little beforehand. We're going to go in alphabetical order. So we'll start with Ham, who is going to share with us some, uh, some insights into what is going on in the Philippines. Take it away, Ham. Thank you so much, Jason. Let me just share my screen. There you have it. So again, um, good afternoon. Maayong hapon sa tanan and um, good day. I am Hamil Karchon Weko Jr. And again, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and she. Um, so basically, I am from Mindanao. Um, a proud Cagayanon. And um, Cagayanon is basically a city in, um, in the Philippines, in the southern part of the Philippines, in Mindanao. Um, I believe that... Um, 
because I was exposed to indigenous communities in the highlands of Bukidnon um, and religious minorities in the south or in Lano del Norte, um, I, I guess I was able to develop a certain attitude of acceptance and understanding towards others. However, despite these privileges, um, I also had my share of homophobic slurs, microaggressions, and even sexual harassment. Um, LGBTIQ people like me in the Philippines face multiple forms of discrimination and inequality just because of who we are, whom we love, or how we look. Let me share with you some of the issues we've encountered recently. These are recent issues that I'd like to share with you. So last May 12, a transgender guest revealed on Facebook how they were not allowed by a resort staff and um, the management um, to use a women's bathroom. The following days, the management of the resort announced that they will be implementing a policy that will ban transgender individuals from resort from the resort because of because a facility for them doesn't exist. An issue that would have been prevented or res, um, responded to, such as this one, um, if only a bill um, against discrimination is in place. However, a bill was first filed in Congress in 2000, in the year 2000. Many years passed and 21 years to be exact, and there is still no national legislation that would protect LGBTIQ individuals from discrimination in the Philippines. Another issue that I'd like to share with our audience, Jason, is the violence against LGBTIQ individuals. Just recently, there's a, um, a community in Ampatuan, Maguindanao, also in Mindanao, has publicly shaved the heads of six women between ages to 16 and 20 for being lesbians. The parents of a local woman complained with local authorities that their daughter cohabitates with a lesbian woman. When the lesbian woman was confronted, she was then told to name other lesbians, lesbians in their locality. All of them, along with their parents, were threatened with fines, though to avoid paying, um, the lesbians agreed to be publicly shamed. So this is not only an LGBTIQ issue, uh, but also seen as violence against women. And just recently, two of the transgender people died during the ongoing pandemic but not because of COVID-19, but because of a virus that have been long existed even before the pandemic, which are homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. At least 50 transgender and gender non-binary individuals have been murdered across the archipelago since 2010. Now the question is, that, now the question is or the challenge is, what should we do then with all of these issues? I personally believe that in order for us to achieve true gender equality, we should amplify the voice of marginalized LGBTIQ individuals. Let's prioritize sexual and gender minorities and invest in their capacities to actively participate in the decision-making process, in their communities and in their fa families. LGBTIQ as a sector is already marginalized per se. Maybe some of you are wondering why there are marge, there's a marginalized word before LGBTIQ, since LGBTIQ is already a marginalized sector. Well, there are LGBTIQ individuals who experience multiple discriminations because of socioeconomic issues, like the LGBTIQ community in Mindanao. The second largest island in the Philippines, or Mindanao, have five major languages and 18 indigenous groups. Given this cultural diversity, Mindanao and LGBTIQ narratives drown in the issues of cultural, religious, and armed conflict in Mindanao. Thus, LGBTIQ issues are put into the sidelines. Realizing, realizing this, together with other LGBTIQ advocates, hold on. Together with other LGBTIQ advocates, we organized Mindanao Pride, which started as an online movement to recognize LGBTIQ individuals in Mindanao that are considered an invisible minority in the Philippines. Our organization serves as a, a composed of lesbian and gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex individuals that focuses on um, promoting SOGSE or sexual orientation, gender identity expression, and sex characteristics, and human rights in general. Let me share with you some of the issues or initiatives that we faced um, in Mindanao through the Mindanao Pride Organization. 
So this is one of our initiatives. It's called Kadaiyahan Pride Festival. So it's actually um, considered the first in Mindanao since it's a week-long celebration. Upon my return in the in the fellowship from the U.S., Mindanao Pride organized Kadaiyahan Pride Festival, inspired from the from our own language, uh, which means diversity. So the celeb that's that that's the meaning of kadaiyahan diversity. The celebration consists of capacity development of um, LGBTIQ advocates and allies, and um, the festival culminated with a first Pride March in um, in the city in Cagayan de Oro, where we held our um, Pride festival, and um, we attracted more than two thousand marchers, and also invited um, gender equality champions all over the Philippines. So let me just um, show this video. Because this land is for all of me now. Muslim, Christian, Luba, bisexual, transgender, straight, intersex, queer, and kung ano ano pa. This is where we come alive. Yeah, so that's basically our. Um, first Pride March as an organization, and I'm, I guess I I would I would also like to recognize um, the U.S. Embassy or the United States government in general because I guess I was inspired by my um, fellowship in the U.S. learning about the U.S. Civil Rights Movement and um, the diff um, the different organizations that are advocacy driven where I was um, exposed to. Another initiative that um, we've done is. Um, lead out the mainstream uh, we would like to mainstream soji in youth advocacy so this is basically um, a three-day capacity building and development on human rights initiatives for youth leaders so let's let me just highlight that these are not only for lgbtiq individuals those who identify as members of the community but most importantly youth leaders in general um, we would we would want to highlight that um, We'd like to mainstream SOGI in there in the different advocacy. So, religious organizations in he, are here, um, and even those who are um, promoting the protection of our environment are also participants of this initiative. Um, just a trivia, I guess. Um, aside from the Pride March, this idea was also developed during my fellowship in the U.S. This is basically my re-entry action initiative when I came back and um, for my fellowship. Here, of course. Um, this is the time um, during the pandemic, uh, given that we have limited um, travel, we have restrictions in our travel, and um, this has also impacted the LGBTIQ, LGBTQI in um, general. Uh, many LGBTIQ individuals are at risk of homelessness and employment and insecurity. And challenged by the coronavirus, LGBTIQ um, individuals were the first responders in their immediate communities. And in providing emergency food assistance, temporary shelter, counseling, and free HIV services. So together with other LGBTIQ, LGBTIQ organizations, um, we've organized an online fundraising concert for LGBTIQ organizations that, are, that were affected by the pandemic. Another initiative that I'm proud of is Bulan Mercado. Bulan is actually inspired from a, from a homosexual deity in the Philippines. Libulan, so coming from that name, and um, of course with the ongoing pandemic again, um, LGBTIQ people are both at a high heightened um, health and economic risk, and thus um, because they are in highly affected industries like the entertainment industry, fashion and beauty industry, often with more um, exposure and or higher economic sensitivity. Mindanao Pride developed this um, platform to feature small and micro LGBTIQ entrepreneurs and service providers to promote their products and services online and help them recuperate from the negative impacts of the pandemic. Due to its innovativeness, 
Um, let me just share that Bulan Mercado took a spot in the recently concluded, I guess this was last December, Unified Awards 2020, organized by U.S. Embassy Manila. So the project won as a runner-up in the category of economic development and entrepreneurship. And of course, lastly, um, another initiative that I was involved in is the YSEALI Camp Diversity. It is a virtual camp that seeks to contribute to creation of inclusive communities through engaging the next generation of young leaders for gender, diversity, and social inclusion. Just a little bit of context, we are looking already at um, having this intersectional lens when we talk about um, the different identities because LGBT, PWD, or the persons with disabilities, women, um, and other marginalized sectors actually have different, uh, have actually have the same issues. They may be unique in each other, but together they call on recognition, representation, and equality. So basically, um, those are the, um, the initiatives that I helped um, implement in promoting a more just and equal Philippines. Um, but for all of you listening out there, I believe that you don't need to do all those things. This is just a reminder um, to our audience. Um, I listed some small things that you can do in your own little ways to contribute in the fight for gender equality. First is that we have to explore our own sense of self. Um, what do you mean? No? So what do, you, what do the definitions bring up for you? When we talk about SOGI SC, um, what do you think does this SOGI SC mean to you? What language do you use to describe your own sense of self? Because we have different definitions. Second would be, um, let's set aside our assumptions and judgments. So let's not assume and be respectful towards others. Um, you cannot tell someone uh, that is he's a member or she is a member of the LGBT community just by looking at them. So um, another one is that we do not ask about a person's genitals, how they have sex, and other personal details that are not relevant to you or their business. Third is uh, we have to be careful about labeling, confidentiality, and disclosure and outing. Because in a heavily prejudiced society, it takes incredible trust for a person of diverse gender and sexuality to disclose their gender identity to you. So, you know, do not just casually share this information or gossip about a person's so GSC. If a person comes to you and is unsure of the label that fits them, um, let's give them time and space because um, coming out is, uh, is a process. So let's not tell them what term they should use. Oh, I've listened to this talk about um, LGBT in the um, US ASEAN. Um, now I'm, I'm now capacitated to, to tell you what's, your, what's, term you should, what's the term you should use. I believe that's wrong because you wouldn't want your, identify, uh, your identity to be defined by others. So let others identify themselves. Fourth, avoid insincere compliments or helpful tips. For example, you look just like a real woman. And I mean, what does a real woman mean? You know, I believe trans women are women, trans men are men. So I, let's avoid those kinds of compliments that are actually um, have a tinge of microaggression. Fifth, um, let's get to know others. So let's talk to people about um, you trust, about Soji, ask them respectfully what is true for them, and talk about the things that confuse you or that you are curious about. And last but not the least, together, you know, if you're not an LGBTIQ person, an individual, that doesn't mean that you can help us for, push for our rights. So help us promote Soji SC, um, be a human rights advocate, and fight for equality. Dagang salamat. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Ham. Thank you for a great presentation. I'm very eager to switch over to Sarah, but I just want to make a couple comments. We'll get to you in one moment, Sarah. But uh, I, I am glad that you mentioned two things, and we'll discuss it a little more later in the program. One being that members of the LGBTI community are not only concerned about rights for the LGBTIQ community, but they're concerned about many issues. They are also concerned about the environment, people with disabilities, all kinds of issues. So that, I'm certainly glad that you mentioned that. 
And the other issue that I want to talk about a little later in the program is the fact that because individuals in this community, in these communities, face so much discrimination, what ends up happening is they can't get a job. And when you can't get a job, then you have problems with homelessness, then you end up going into dangerous occupational fields, you might start selling drugs, or you might enter into sex work, not because you want to, but because you have to survive and you have to pay the bills. So there are many complexities to the issue, additional issues that occur in the journey when people cannot find work and there's so much employment discrimination. So we'll talk about that a little more later and I'm, I'm sure Sarah will have comments about that as well. But I did want to ask you one question before I switch. So I was very moved by your story of these lesbian women who had their heads shaved and they were shamed in the community. And I'm wondering if you were talking to someone from that community, which obviously has very, uh, very specific concepts of right and wrong based on their culture, based on their religion. If you were talking to a member of that community who didn't agree with the head shaving, what would your advice be to that person to engage in dialogue with people who thought that this head shaving punishment was acceptable or appropriate? What advice would you give to that person? Well, the first advice, or maybe my first comment would, 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 um, would be um, like gender, um, our culture, our traditions and our beliefs are as dynamic and are ever changing, just like our gender. And thus, um, given that context, we have to also um, ensure that everyone is um, protected from discrimination and violence. And these people, we should just focus on their humanity rather than um, their rather than their gender or sexuality. That's it for me, Jason. I think that's an excellent point to focus on the fact that we're all human beings. At the end of the day, we are all human beings. We have some differences, but we share that in common. It's an excellent point. Let's switch over and let's give Sarah a turn. We're looking forward to your presentation as well. Take it away, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone again. And hi, Jason. So I'm going to present my um, presentation here. All right, so Ham, you did a very good job and I will continue to talk about the community in Thailand. So let me first introduce my project, which is not to let to be equal. So today's presentation outline is going to be about problem identification of Thai LGBTQ plus community. The project goals and strategy and key activity that I have done in the past until now. So the problem identification, why I have to talk about this, is just because a lot of people saying that trans women or LGBTQ plus people are facing a lot of positivity nowadays, but in fact, it's not. A third of 2000 and two, 2000, uh, uh, 2000 survey LGBT students has been physically harassed and fought and sexually and bullying. And I have to say that it's also happened in Thailand and everywhere around the world. So this is why I have to start started my own campaign. Uh, many people would say that in Thailand, we are a heathen for LGBTQ+, right? But we are just socially accepted. We are not legally accepted. For example, we don't have same-sex marriage. We don't have gender recognition laws. And we don't have LGBTQIA plus rights that protect us. For example, if I want to um, I have a marriage, I'm getting married with someone, they would not allow me to do it. And I would lo lose a lot of opportunities and a lot of rights that I deserve. And also gender recognition. It's happened a lot for trans women when we have to travel around the world and they would, wouldn't let us go out of the gate because our gender 
in the identification card doesn't match with our physical appearance and they will think that we are a thief or we are a crime to go to their countries. And also LGBTQ plus rights that a lot of people would say that Thailand, oh, you are very accepted by the community. Well, they're just due to us. They see us on the street, they see us on the workplace, or, but they just see us as a person. But in terms of regularization, we don't have anything to protect us. For example, if a trans woman get raped, they would not call it a case or, or that person would not get arrested because they say that that is not a genital for a trans woman, it's a wound. And they have to sue in the courts in order to get that person arrested. It's happened in the past in Thailand. So that is why I have to start my own project to call out for this issue. My project goal goes to create mutual understanding for LGBTQIA+, especially for transgender, and to educate people, the, the youth, to understand more about LGBTQIA+, because I think that to communicate with the youth is something that very useful because the youth is someone who's gonna change the futures. So my project objective, we have three things. We have awareness from the people. We want to change perception of the people and then turn it into action. My target is the youth and all genders age between 15 to 25 years old. And my strategy and key activities, I want to promote the creative content, social movements, and also do some collaboration with nonprofit organizations. So I have been doing it all the past. And I want to push a positive reinforcement for the community to see that we can be a good leadership in our community, no matter what gender we are, and we can be a quality and qualified people in the community. So I created both like social media platform on online, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and also offline on a seminar and workshop. And key achievements of not to let the vehicle, uh, we'll speak about this. So the first thing that I did in the past and I have been doing until now is that I create a educating and awareness content with Thai celebrities and it's well received and the response is so good. And um, a lot of Thai celebrities, they are interested in gender equality. So when it comes to speaking about this issue, they have mainly focus on their rights to speak. For example, Kun Sindi Srinja, uh, she's a model um, and she talked about, don't tell me how to dress because women are a victim blaming in the society when they get raped and men tend to put a brim on them. And she's, the Thai celebrity, they said that, don't ever, ever judge me how I look or how I dress, but judge yourself who raised me. It's hard that we should put the blame on the perpetrator, not the female. And also I talked to the transgender lecturer on the right, um, right hand side of my presentation. She is the regular in Thai university and she is a trans woman also. But you know what? People are always saying that um, we are accepted, we are accepted, but when she have to go to be a lecturer in Thai university, they would not accept her to be, to be um, a, a lecturer in the university. So she had, to, she had to sue the university in order for herself to get a job. And I talked to her and she said that there are a lot of things to be improved in Thailand. And I also talked to a lesbian um, queen, beauty queen in Thailand is on the left hand side uh, in down below. She is a beauty queen and she advocates for lesbian and LGBTQ plus rights. And these, all these contents has been made a lot of good, like in, impactful to the community. And uh, a lot of people coming to say to me that, thank you for doing such a very good content because they don't know that a lot of Thai celebrity, they are interested in gender equality. More than that, I create some awareness content with high engagement talking about Thai entertainment industry. For example, I talk about how to normalize feminine gays in Thai entertainment industry because in the past, Thailand, we have like such a very perceptual way of, uh, per of perceiving gay community. If you are gay, you have to be masculine, you have to be handsome, you have to be rich and those marginalized gay that have a very feminine look and um, doesn't have any muscle or anything, they would not socially accepted by the society. That is why I created um, this kind of contents to normalize feminine gaze and 
to talk about stigmatization of LGBTQ plus in my love silly and everything that we, pr we protected in our country. And yeah, it has been um, a very good, uh, we have received a very good comments from the social media and that is how we change the world. And I also have social media campaign on Facebook and Instagram is um, the gender recognition in Thai university which I did a survey on um, university and also gathering all the data into um, into the legalization. So I put all the data and talk to the courts, talk to the uh, many sector in Thailand that we have to change that. I think that uni students in university should have the gender recognition that they want to. For example, if they are trans women, they can use myths in front of their name. And if they are trans men, they can use Mr. in front of their name. It's a very important thing in Thailand that we have to march for. And it turned out that after we did the social media campaign and also um, gathering a lot of data and talk to those university, it has been changed. Around two, two or three community and university, they changed the laws that uh, their student can use gender recognition that they want. They can use Miss or Mr. if they want to. And I also use stuff based shaming for trans people because in Thailand we have the uh, perception that if you are want, if you want to be a trans woman, you have to be beautiful or you have to be funny to be socially accepted. And that is not okay. That is why I, I put on the side stuff based shaming on transgender. And a lot of media in Thailand use my campaign to project out and to talk about how transgender women should be. We, we, we shouldn't be looked at something that is like a woman or we shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to be funny. We can be ourselves. We don't have to look like a real woman or anything because we are us, we are trans women. That is why I pr promote this campaign and this has been a very um, good campaign for trans women in the next generation. And the last part of my project is about, I am a spokesperson for a lot of NGO in Thailand and also uh, my organization. So. The role of spokesperson of me is to advocate for, for the trans women and to be a youth representation. So I got a chance to be a, a transgender youth representation for the UN, uh, UN conference in 2020. And I talk a lot about trans, trans women in Thai society and how we want to be uh, socially and regally accepted by the society. And also I went to the Hero Awards with each the awards for um, activists in Asia and Pacific. And yes, that is how I did my project. And I really wanted to change in Thailand and also around the Southeast Asia community that we shouldn't be treated as a marginalized people. We should be treated as a human being. The reason why we marched for everything, we did a lot of campaign that I talk about. We did a lot of um, social media content is that we want one only one thing with its gender equality. We want the equality that we deserve as a human being. We don't want to be a privileged um, gender or recognition or anything. We just want to be human. And I want everyone to look at us and see us as a human being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And once again, that vital point about uh, everyone is a human being, so let's try to get to know each other and let's appreciate that that is the one element that we all have in common. We are all human beings. So I do want to, exp I do want to explore a little more what you were talking about, and in particular with the gender recognition laws. This is a, this is a topic that has been debated in numerous countries, and you, you put the issue well, but just for our audience, so this, what we're talking about is on identity cards, such as a passport or a driver's license. Mm -hmm. Typically those identifier, <clears throat> excuse me, identification documents have some kind of indication of the individual sex and it's usually male or female. So okay. in Thailand, what would you advocate for? Would you want to have a third category for transgender individuals? Or would you want uh, people who were born male to 
be able to change that marker on their identification and, and have it read female. Which of those two scenarios do you advocate for? Okay, I'm, I might not say that only me advocate for. It's all of us advocate for one thing because trans women is a woman. And that is why we advocate to be a she or her on our gender uh, identity on identification card, passport, or driver license. And it has been on the courts for so long. And we have been talking about this for over 10 years. And it's on the process of legalization. And it has been rejected last year. So we have to continue moving on to, to this thing. And you know what? One thing that happened in Thailand, they said that they don't want to change our gender recognition because they think that we are gonna be gonna tell a lie to the the people in Thailand, for example, if I am a trans, if I'm a trans man, maybe I talk that, oh, I'm naturally born as a male. But in fact, it's not. We cannot lie to the community. You can see and uh, look at me, look at my voice. You can hear my voice. And it, it shows that we are trans women and we just want the same rights as women. So it doesn't mean that we are going to tell a lie to the society that we are real women. That is not. We just want the right to be, to be the same as those women because we identify ourselves as a women. That is why I'm advocate for it. I think that every transgender in the world uh, want this because when I was in the States, they used gender pronouns as a female with me, she and her. And that was like the most awesome thing that I experienced in the, in the States. And yes, ever since I stepped my, my, my feet on to like um, the airport, they call me Madame. And that is something that I, I cannot have in my own community and my own country. That is why I like it a lot. And I think that we should be treated as a woman because we identify ourselves as a woman. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that point. That, that is a topic of conversation in many countries. And as you say, or said in your presentation, it's an issue that comes up a lot because we all constantly, we have to show our passport or a driver's license. So a lot of people just take this for granted because they don't think about these issues. But if you're trans, you are gonna think about these issues on a regular basis. So thanks for clarifying that. So we do have a question from the audience and perhaps both of you could weigh in on this issue. The issue of trans athletes has been in the news a lot recently, particularly because a, a New Zealand trans weightlifter has been selected to participate in the Olympic committee. And so this has touched all kinds of issues on what's fair and women's sports and trans participation. And, and we hear lots of different opinions. So I'd love to hear your opinions on this topic. Uh, we'll give Ham a try because we, uh, we haven't had him speak for a few moments. So Ham, why don't you take this very difficult question first? Well, for me, it's um, we should see trans women who are um, <clears throat> Who are ma are also capable the same way as um, cisgender um, athletes, you know, man or woman, because um, I think that again, gender is a social construct, and thus, so long as they don't use any enhancers to um, improve their um, capacity or to to level up their um, to step up their game, basically in competing in that particular sports, so long as they don't do that then I believe um, they should be allowed in sports and they should be um, recognized the same way as we recognize um, other cisgender athletes. Thank you, Ham. And Sarah, what's, what's your take on this, on this topic? I totally agree with Ham. And I have to say with a lot of uh, topics. The first thing is that I think that trans women should be accepted as a woman. That is why we should be participating in the sport as a woman. And the second thing is that people were arguing about our physical ability that we potentially have more than women. And I have to say that if you have the gender, uh, gender re gender reassignment surgery, you would lose all your physical abilities because you don't have testosterone anymore. The, the male um, 
hormone. So you have to take uh, the female hormone into your body and it's weaken your body. So sometimes we have the same uh, level of abilities as women when we have already had the section reassignment surgery and our muscle tend to be gone because we don't have the, the male uh, hormone anymore. So people were arguing about our hormone that sometimes if we have more testosterone, then we would have the power or ability than women. In fact, it's not because comparing to a woman, a woman, some women, they have high testosterone also, and they have more physical ability than than the women themselves. So I think that we shouldn't talk about the hormone thing or physical appearance because sometimes some trans women, they are weaker than the real women because we lose a lot in terms of health when we have the sexual reassignment surgery and we, we can be weakened in terms of like physical abilities. That is my point of view. Thanks so much. And I do appreciate your point of view. And I'll just comment a little bit on this topic. And it's very interesting. I was listening to a radio program last week in which there were two guests, both trans women, and they had a different point of view on this particular topic. And we've had some trans women in the United States speak out. And we've had some lesbian women speak out uh, against trans women participating in women's sports. So just like in any community, and I, I do think it's important to make this point, in any community, you're going to have different points of view. And so part of understanding the LGBTI community is that these are every member of the community is a human being with different points of view. And part of respecting human beings is understanding that just because you know two trans women doesn't mean they'll always agree on things. They're individuals, they're people. And so we should have dialogue and conversation. We have another question from our audience. This is from Maulana Difari. Oh, I'm sorry, that previous question about trans, that was from one of our wonderful uh, community members named Skylar. So thank you for asking that question, Skylar. But let's turn to Maulana Jafari. Jif I hope I'm saying your name correctly. So I see, okay. So she's talking about how people sometimes are raised in a certain culture, a certain religion, certain family values. And sometimes those values are very opposed to being gay, being lesbian, being trans. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. <laughs> <clears> throat> so, if you would talk a little bit about your families, <clears throat> sorry, your families and how they, how they came to grips with your coming out and being so vocal and so public. Sarah, would you mind telling us a little bit about how your family responded when you came out as transgender? Okay, sure. Um, I came out when I was seven to, to eight years old. I was so confident that I don't want to be um, a man. <laughs> so I talked with my family that I want to be a female when I grew up. And they noticed my behavior that I acted only like a woman since I was, I was in kindergarten. So they kind of like, I'm, I have to say that I have such a privilege because my family accepted me the way I am since I was in, um, in element, elementary school. And when I talked to my mom, she had this, the, the strategy to talk to my father. And my father is kind of like, he had a very open heart. And when he, he talked to me, he said that, Sarah, if you want to become trans woman or any gender that you want, I appreciate how you are, how you, uh, see yourself as that gender. And I think that I'm going to support you throughout your life. And that is something that made me cry when I was in elementary school because I was so young and maybe they would just thought that I was just kidding, but they really appreciate the way that I could find myself. And my mom said to me that there are a lot of trans women in Thai society. So you are normal. You are not something that abnormal girl we will see you as a woman and we're so proud of you. That is how I came out with my family. And yeah, they, they kind of like accepted me since I was talking to them at that moment. You are so fortunate, Sarah. And I applaud your parents because 
so many, there are so many stories of individuals in the LGBTIQ community that their, their parents find out and they are kicked out of the house or they're abused or they're treated very, very poorly. And so part of the conversation of LGBTIQ is discussions with parents about yeah. taking care of their children and being allies of their children. That's a very important piece of this puzzle. Yeah. Hey, Al, tell us about your, your life story and your parents. You told us a little bit in your presentation, but tell us some more. Well, um, <clears throat> for in my case, I believe that I was also the same with Sarah. I was also born um, privileged in a way that my family also they didn't have a problem with me having um, being gay, having um, this emotional and sexual attraction towards the same sex. Um, I guess the problem came in when um, I started being an identifying myself as an activist, as an advocate for LGBTIQ rights, given that our, um, given that the southern part of the Philippines, which I mentioned earlier, Mindanao, is has dif different um, cultures and traditions, thus um, having this um, conservative environment, which LGBTIQs are, is the conversation or the issue or the discourse about LGBTIQ is considered a taboo. Thus, um, that's the time that they were, they, they told me that um, they're afraid of me. They have um, fears that I will be um, kidnapped and be killed somewhere just because of um, the way I identify. And, at the, and basically the organization that I'm representing and the kind of political, uh, temperamental political space that we have in, in Mindanao. So yes, growing up, I don't have any problem, but I'm currently facing um, opposition against my parents with, uh, with the advocacy that I'm pushing for right now. Absolutely. Uh, while, you were, while you were both talking, I was thinking about another question that we received from one of our audience members. And I'm gonna ask it in the following way. So for, for, for gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and trans people, there are a lot of perceptions about gender expression and how people should act. And so it was very interesting what you were talking about, Sarah, about how in Thai entertainment, you can be gay as long as you're hyper-masculine or what some people might say, straight acting. So uh, there are many people who no matter what they do, it's obvious that they are a feminist and that they may be gay. We, we shouldn't make that assumption about people, but they're very effeminate. So most people will assume they're gay or certain women who are very, who uh, present uh, stereotypical masculine traits. So assumptions are made about them and it's about being true to themselves. What do you see in terms of employment discrimination and social discrimination with people who may or may not be gay or lesbian, but they're either very masculine women or very feminine women? And what can we do about that? What can we do about those stereotypes and, and the discrimination they face? What, what are your thoughts on that? Let's start with Sarah. Okay. First point is that I think that it doesn't mean that they have to be gay or lesbian if they protect themselves up as masculine or feminine. I think that the thing that we should do is ask them whether what, um, ask them politely, like what gender you are. You shouldn't be assuming people to be gay or lesbian, no matter how they protect themselves, even feminine, masculine, because some people, they protect themselves out as a straight, but Actually, they are gay. So I, I have to say that we have to ask them first and to stop this kind of stereotype session, I think that we should create a lot of campaigns to talk about this. For example, I did a campaign that I talk about we should normalize being a feminine gay and feminine gay should be more accepted in society. And you know what? The media has been putting my post that I, I wrote the article about this online. And a lot of people take this me that they are so happy that I talk about this because in Thailand, feminine gay don't get 
don't get to be don't get the appreciation like masculine gay so they they talk to me that you i am a, like a social motivator for them to make such a shame in the society that we talk about this online the media talk about this online that is how i create a social movement in my country and a lot of celebrity that follow me on my instagram and they just post about this also on their instagram is how i use influencer around me to push this thing and to break the stereotype by using the influencer power and also the media power thank you and ham what can you say about that Well, as for me, I um, the common misconception here in the Philippines is that when we talk about sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, and sex characteristics, it always points towards the LGBTIQ plus community, which is totally wrong. Because when we talk about SOGSC, it talks about everyone, including um, straight individuals, you know. And straight acting is basically a gender expression. So um, I believe that in order for us to break this kind of mindset, break stereotypes, um, smash you know smash the gender norms that we have, we have to continue raising awareness on um, the concept of SOGSC and ensure that SOGSC is being understood not only by those who have access to it, but ensure that even marginalized LGBTIQs. Um, from geographically isolated and um, disadvantaged areas are also um, aware of this concept. So I guess increasing, I, I believe that the first um, step towards empowerment is really awareness. I agree. We did get a question from Ricardo about coming out and the coming out process. I apologize, Ricardo. I don't completely understand your question, but I think he's talking about how do we create an environment in which people are more comfortable with coming out. What do you see as the as the primary barriers? You mentioned a lot of uh, challenges, but what would you recommend for advocates as the 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 path to making coming out just an acceptable part of the human journey and the human experience. Where, where do you focus most of your energy? Let's start with Sarah. Okay, I have to say that I am a consultation for a lot of trans girls in my community in Thailand. And also for gay people also, they approached me, talked to me how they can come out with their family. So my advice for them, I think that they should talk to their parents choose to talk with their parents. For example, if their mom are more accepted, then talk to, to their mom first and then let, the, the, let their parents talk to each other and spread out the news about you. But it doesn't mean that you have to tell the world who you are. I think that you have to tell only to the people that, that can accept you first. Sometimes it's gonna take a lot of time for them to understand you because it's about changing the perception of people, then take time for them. And, Sometimes you just have to show them that you are that, that gender identity and you really want to live like this. And if they really love you, they would accept you. But if they don't accept you, take time to talk with them. So for me, it's about the strategy to talk with the, your family members, you to talk with the person who can accept you first. Excellent advice. Pam? Well, as for me, I always believed in the power of storytelling, Jason and um, Sarah. So um, in order for us to have this um, as a community that is built on um, a safe space for everyone to come out, we need to continue sharing stories about people um, who successfully come out to, to their families or to their friends or in their community. And this might not be an advice, a practical advice to um, people who are in the um, who are struggling right now. But in the important thing here is the allies, you know, allies such as you know the U.S. Embassy organizations who are not part of the LGBTIQ community, but who are um, accepting of the LGBT advocacy and people. So whenever we share and give space to people who can share their narratives. People will have that kind of um, inspiration and bravery to come out, you know, and um, have this also build on um, 
different strategies you know on their on their own because i always believe too on their on their own personal journey i mean no one should dis- dictate um how someone should come out and even the concept of coming out is actually questionable for me i mean that's my comment because i believe coming out is also a social construct no one needs to come out because if you are comfortable with yourself already if you are happy with your um with who you are then you don't have to prove yourself to other people but i also believe in the power of coming out when we talk about the lgbtiq um advocacy because um identifying yourself as an lgbt contributes actually um to the to the movement it gives it power when you identify yourself you are putting a highlight on the issues of sexual and gender minorities such as yourself but i would say that let's continue to share more stories about people like us people who go beyond this gender binary that is set up by a system of patriarchy yes mm-hmm. that's so good <laughs> thanks Sarah. i do want to ask you a question and it's it's maybe a little more controversial but there's a belief that some people have and you might be able to add some insights as a as a trans woman so some people are concerned that young boys who are effeminate, who are gay, might be pushed or encouraged or told that you're actually a trans girl or a, a young girl who is a, a masculine person who will probably grow up to be lesbian will be pushed and told, oh, you're really a boy, you should be trans. And they really think that the trans process is that simple and that that's what, that's what adults and psychologists are doing. Could you dispel that myth and, and tell a little bit more about how mental health professionals and counselors help parents separate the, the, these two potential issues? Because I, I want it clear to people that children are not being pushed into being trans. If, if they have those feelings, they're being explored, but they're not being pushed into it. Could you talk about that a little bit? I'm actually, ju- I'm actually shocked by that news. I haven't heard of that, Jason, but um, it seems like it's just the same with conservation camps. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You know, in other religions, they have these conservation camps where you will convert, um, you know, LGBT into individuals to becoming straight, you know. And I guess um, in that case, that is some, that is like the, the opposite of that as well. You know, the, the same. I mean, in a way that it's the same because you're also pushing someone. And I'm not sure whether that's, I, I, I haven't heard of that. But if that, actually happens i mean if that's actually happening then i believe that's also wrong i mean pushing someone to become who they are is um also a process of manipulation you know manipulation and you know in in sociology terminology that's canalization i would say you know less saying someone that um he or she is a boy or he or she is a girl despite that she identifies otherwise you know so um when we talk about gender identity it's again an experience of someone's own gendered experience you know and having that kind of experience is unique in every individual and shouldn't be um dictated by by their parents or by someone who is you know um, more powerful than them. They should have that power to decide for themselves. Okay. Well put. Um, Please, Sarah, add your comments to this as well. Okay. I have to say like him. I haven't heard of that story also, but if it's very happening, I think that nobody should dictate someone to, to identify themselves as a trans or as a gay or as a lesbian. I think that it's a self-determination that they should perceive with themselves. You know what, in Thailand, we're having a movement that we don't have to see the men, men like the psychiatrists sci- artists to identify ourselves. Or in European country, they let the children choose their gender identity for themselves. They don't have to see the psychiatrists sci- artists or the mental health like um, hospital to identify themselves anymore. So as for me, I think it's about self-determination and gender is fluidity. So it can be changed over time. Maybe right now you want to be gay, 
when you grow up, somehow you want to be a trans woman, and somehow you want to come back to be gay. It happened in Thailand, and I think that it's pretty normal. It's all about self determination. Childhood is a very complex time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Children go through various phases and complexities, and they go through lots of questions. And hopefully, parents will let them go through that process and discover who they are. That's very important. It's it's a time of support. But I completely agree with you. No child should be directed into a certain direction. That child should be allowed to explore who he or she is. Go through that those years of maturation, exploration, discovery, and have the freedom to do that. And that's really what we're talking about today. We're talking about giving human beings the respect and dignity to explore and discover who they are and be given the space to do that. So that's what we all hope for. So we're coming down to this hour just flew by too quickly. There was so much, we touched on so many issues, but I would like to give both of you the opportunity to add a final thought. So let's start with Sarah. Okay, so as for me, I want to speak to a lot of people that we have to be to, to be more open-minded about gender identities nowadays because before coming here, I have received a lot of hateful comments about my gender identity. So I so that I'm going to be projecting our trans community and also LGBTQ plus for Dwight Seeley. And I have to say that if you don't really accept in who I am, maybe you just open your mind to, to accept LGBTQ plus as a holistic community because we are moving forward to the future. And I think that in order to live in the better future, I think that we should have the empathy in the, the way that we see each other. I would not um, say something bad to straight people. And I think that you should do the same because we are human beings just like, just like um, every other did or do. And I think that we should respect in who we are. And that is what the basic thing I wanna tell every people around the world, around the world that we should have respect to each other. Thank you, Sarah. And Ham? Um, maybe my message for everyone is that let's always um, also push for a future that is intersectional. Intersectional in a sense that we have to see that our oppressions and our um, different identities are actually linked. You know, um, this in the, um, our age, our gender, our um, race, our sexuality are interlinked and interdependent to, to um, one another. And thus, um, I've always, I, I'm always inspired by uh, Martin Luther King Jr., but I have a different spin on it. Um, I'm, I like her, his quote about, um, regardless of gender, um, I dream of a day that age, gender, sexuality, your disability or your ability, um, is not you are not judged by those characteristics, but you are judged by the content of your character. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, and I I I I, I can't escape uh, mentioning to everyone that one of Martin Luther King's primary speechwriters was a gay black man in the in the civil rights era when homosexuality. Well, homosexual sex was illegal in most states in the United States. So Martin Luther King was definitely thinking about the future. And the United States is a complex history where we just keep getting better and better at allowing people the space to be who they are, to explore who they are, as I was saying earlier. And you both encapsulated so much. It's about having empathy. We may not always agree on every specific policy point, but if we could all agree to have conversations, to have dialogue, to do our best to show love and respect to each other and give each other dignity, then this world would be an amazing place. So let's keep working together to reach that point. Again, thank you so much, Ham. Thank you so much, Sarah. You gave us so much to think about, to chew on, to turn over and we're working together, progressing to a better and better world. So thank you so much. Happy Pride Month, everyone. I hope that if you find this 
this video after our live show much later and you have questions that you still, you reach out to us. Pam and Sarah are part of the Waisili family. That's the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative. We can help you get in touch with them. We can help you find mentors on all kinds of topics, LGBTQ.